As you know, ISCON Communications tries to discuss many important topics for ISCON through its journal in the form of articles or in the conference in the form of presentations. And now we're starting a new series of books called ISCON Insight Series. We just published the, the Interfaith booklet, uh, which was published many years ago by Shona Karishi Prabhu. So now we're starting to publish more in-depth uh, books and booklets on, on different topics. So we have a long list of topics. I'll just mention a few of them. Of course, the ones we're going to discuss the next few days are part of that list. So the topics are ISCON and identity, ISCON and sexuality, ISCON and veganism, ISCON and controversial remarks in Srila Prabhupada's teachings, ISCON and youth, ISCON and Gaudiya Math, ISCON and the environment, ethics, Hinduism, science, education, Varnashram, abuse, LGBTQIA communities, politics, popular culture, management and leadership, interfaith, women, yoga, health, the, the internet, social media, people with disabilities, neurodivergence and mental disorders, academia, Vaishnavism, religious freedom, legal issues, cult watching organizations, culture, and I guess I covered most of the topics that the whole of humanity is talking about these days. So uh, today's uh, presentation is focused on identity and we're limiting, we're limiting it to specifically national, cultural and religious identity. And as an international movement, uh, we have members from many different backgrounds with many different material identities. So we would like to discuss with you how much can the movement accommodate all these different identities in a positive way, integrate these identities and still allow devotees to make spiritual advancement and, and become devotees uh, of Krishna and followers of Srila Prabhupada? And when do these identities can become detrimental or ab obstacles on the path of Krishna consciousness or our in att attempt to become devotees of Krishna and followers of Srila Prabhupada? So maybe you can present these two different aspects of identity from your perspective, your realizations, and many of the things you have done in this area. Thank you. Uh, in 1974, Prabhupada sent me to Latin America, and that was a new cultural experience for me. In many ways, very different. I had always taken for granted that the North American Hare Krishna movement was Vedic culture. And... Um, I think like anything else, there are reasonable limits. For example, to give an example of something which is not a reasonable limit um, or beyond reasonable limits, uh, as we know, there's a, a war going on in a certain part of the world right now that's in the news all the time in uh, East Europe. And uh, devotees from, well, to be honest, Russia, Many of them, it appears, or I don't know the number, I don't want to speak without knowledge, but a significant number of devotees seem to have adopted the idea that the West is evil and Russia is saving the world from the evil West and that it's justified, you know, to, in, that, in pursuit of that goal to, uh, you know, bomb innocent people. So I think that's, an, that's a case where, let's say, extreme nationalism is beyond the line. So it's good kind of to give examples. So, so extreme nationalism leading to the justification of violence, I think, is uh, is beyond the line. Things that obviously are not, or the things that are obviously acceptable would be cuisine or, um, I don't know, even sensitivity, for example, and I'm in Latin America right now, and they just have a different way of relating to each other in the sense that it's sort of, it's very affectionate, it's very personal. And of course, there's a downside to that also because there's a lot of quarreling sometimes, but, but it's a different culture. And so Krishna West is very, very successful in, especially in the Southern part of Latin America, uh, Chile, Argentina, parts of Brazil and so on, extremely successful. And, uh, and I think, you know, we have to do things. So things, it's like, it's like beta, beta. We have to accommodate certain types of cultural manifestations, but at the same time, everyone that joins the Hare Krishna movement, to some extent, has to agree to meet in the center. 
And I think that being rational, being reasonable is not just ethnic or cultural or geographic. It's just being reasonable. And so uh, there has to be a combination of a reasonable meeting in the center and accommodating ethnic, cultural, regional, cultural traits that don't violate, for example, the reasonable development and administration of the Hare Krishna movement. And it's the duty of the leaders to find that line. So do you, do you have some maybe more examples of how the movement can accommodate different uh, cultural identities and religious identities or even national well, identity in a positive well, way? Yeah, one obvious example is the absolute need, certainly in the Western world, and probably other places, to have uh, women treated with full di dignity and respect, have the same rights of men. It's just the kiss of death right now in, in Western Europe and in uh, certainly in North America, and increasingly, frankly, in South, I would say just in the Western Hemisphere in general, especially in the more developed countries. Uh, you know, I mean, in civil matters, it's actually considered criminal to discriminate against women. Obviously, religions have certain uh, rights according to their own teachings, but the fact that it's criminal in, in, in all the developed Latin American countries discriminate shows the attitude of the society in general. And so if we, let's say, standing upon our, our uh, religious identity, if we insist upon certain policies that are actually looked upon as criminal in civil matters in these places, obviously the government or the society may tolerate our right to exercise religious freedom, but they won't tolerate our right to be respected members of society. And, that, and there's a difference there. So, um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, like, that's like another line which is not created by us, but even by governments and by society in general, that certain well, things well, are the not. Government, yeah, yeah, yeah. The governments are just following the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're basically in the Western world, including Latin America, uh, societies, whole societies, majority by majority, have decided that certain acts have no place in a civilized society. Now, one can say, well, we can't follow everything, but you know, these governments are not requiring us to eat meat. They're not requiring us to engage in illicit sex or gamble or anything like that. And so none of these, for example, the same societies that demand equality for women also respect, uh, for example, veganism or vegetarianism. I found in my tour around Latin America and large audiences that, that when I present no illicit sex, I talk about it as fidelity in marriage being faithful to your marriage partner, no, no resistance whatsoever. So in terms of our basic principles, in terms of our basic practices, there's no resistance, there's no serious criticism. So therefore the argument cannot be given, well, we can't just reinvent ourselves according to what the public thinks because the public thinks in general in the West that we have a right to practice bhakti yoga, but we don't, but it's not good to discriminate against women based on the bodily con concept. It's very interesting that these materialistic societies have to teach the devotees not to be in the bodily concept of life. I mean, that, that irony was not lost on me. So you, so you conceive of a movement that has a serious or important uh, cultural, <laughs> national, and religious uh, sensitivities, which are different. So there might be different manifestations in different parts of the movement, but still we're all trying to become devotees of Krishna and follow Srila Prabhupada. So there has to be, we have to find this balance between different parts of the world that have different sensitivities, but at the same time feel united and feel that we're all devotees of, course. of Krishna. Yeah, yeah, of course. However, we, you know, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that in, in, in 1830, that intelligence and the mode of goodness, buddhi, one sees the underlying unity, the underlying oneness, even among different things. Whereas in the mode of passion, one doesn't see that. One only sees the, the differences, the conflicts as fundamental. And so I would say, you know, devotees, and in some cases I would have to say so-called devotees, who are willing to split ISKCON or are willing to just keep ISKCON in a perpetual state of, of, of conflict, uh, are not in the mode of goodness and, and much less on the transcendental platform. So inevitably in any large scale society, 
there will be mundane people who rise to positions of ecclesiastic leadership. There are persons who don't really understand how important it is to Prabhupada and to the world. It was important to Prabhupada because it's important to the world to keep his con united. And so I think reasonable devotees, devotees who actually understand Prabhupada and understand Krishna, will, you know, there'll be give and take. There'll be give and take Guyamakyati Prichati to keep ISKCON united, which is a primary need. And so it's ludicrous, for example. Well, well, I you know, I won't I won't pursue that. There are many ludicrous things in the world, so why don't we go on? Yeah, so I guess we have to learn the art of 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 balancing things between you know certain uh, accommodating certain material identities and at the same time keeping Krishna consciousness in the center. And when things get out of hand, the material identities get kind of overemphasized to the detriment of our our you know trying to be devotees of Krishna. Then we need to have devotees and and authorities in in, in who can guide us and give us the the right understanding. When yeah, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the problems with that, see, one of the problems in doing that is the uh, very significant and rapidly growing imbalance between the Indian mission and the Western mission. And uh, increasingly, I hear stories, even in America, for example, that a Western, you know, Western birth devotee will go to a temple, which is almost all Indian, and will not feel welcome, will feel like discriminated against, like not part of the tribe. And also we find, uh, if we can be honest, you know, among ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the case of, say, Lokanaswami, and, and, and certainly in the, in, in the, in the uh, and, and the fact that, uh, let's say that uh, so-called, uh, what was his name? Uh, the sannyasi in my poor former sannyasi in my under Dejavapu. The fact that there are such different views on this, or, or actually a better example is Vaishnavi Diksha Gurus. What we're seeing is either people from an Indian, not all people in Indian background, not demonizing Indian devotees. Many of the greatest devotees in ISKCON come from the Indian background, and thousands of excellent devotees come from an Indian background. So it's not about that. But it's the fact that certain people, and some of the worst, are people born in the West who have become, you know, the new converts. They're they're more Hindu than the most Hindu, and uh, that imbalance is creating a serious political imbalance. So rather than ISKCON having a let's say you know a balance to accommodate different cultures, increasingly people either you know traditional people from Indian background or what I call the white Hindus, what they're doing is imposing their way and threatening, making sort of, you know, thinly veiled threats to split up ISKCON and, and really having contempt for Western culture. It's very interesting. Of course, in Russia, you find that also, but in a very different manifestation. And so I think that the, the extreme imbalance between preaching success in India and the West is creating a very dangerous political divide. And so that ISKCON no longer increasingly represents what the world community of devotees thinks, but rather an imposition of people either in India or whatever representing that point of view who simply think the Western mission is insignificant, it's tiny, it's irrelevant, and does not have to be considered. And that, you know, if the West says this is what we need to preach, it's simply a new form of colonialism. You know, it's just sort of like a type of uh, moral, intellectual, cultural colonialism. And so um, the preaching imbalance, there was, I won't mention names, but there was a prominent leader in ISKCON who during the Robin George case said, in America, we now have to pivot to the Indian community. Our priority is no longer the Western community. And that was a disaster. And also the refusal to understand that we have to adopt certain external measures. We're having tremendous success with Krishna West. We're making, frankly, many more Western devotees. Wherever we have a, a serious Krishna West program, we're making many more devotees than traditional temples. Not only that, but the class of Western devotees, doctors, lawyers, psychologists, college professors, architects. Those are the kind of people who are, not, who are actually declaring themselves to be members of ISKCON, followers of Prabhupada, 
uh, going for initiation, and we find that wherever we have a strong Christian West program, and 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 frankly, a lot of leaders are oblivious to this, which gets to one more point. If I could take another minute, in my view, there's something extremely important about Prabhupada that the leaders of ISKCON today don't understand, and that is that Prabhupada was absolutely determined at whatever cost, I mean, not whatever cost, we can't cross certain lines, to make the movement work in the West. He was absolutely determined for this. Prabhupada said over and over and over again, the whole worldwide success of his mission depended on making the movement work in the West. And so even though the movement is just a remnant of what it was in America or Canada or many other Western countries and Western Europe, even though it's just just a, the remnants of a movement, the GBC actually doesn't have a strategy or a policy. This is never talked about. On the GBC conference, you know, I pity a person who even brings up this topic. So there's no GBC policy. There's no visible GBC concern as a group. There's no strategy. And so it's just, it, it's like bury your head in the sand and ignore the fact that from a point of view of a serious academic historian, ISKCON as a powerful worldwide movement is not making it. If you, I, for example, when the GBC resolutions come out, the first thing I always look at every year is who are the new sannyas and guru candidates and who are the people who are taking sannyas to becoming gurus now? And the West is simply fading from view. It's an existential crisis. And so Prabhupada's whole global strategy is at risk. Prabhupada's whole global strategy is not making it. And no one seems to care about this because it's politically incorrect. Because if you even bring this up, it may offend, you know, an Indian donor. So, and I've been called a racist. You know, I, you know, Krishna West has been called racist because we focus on trying to reach a certain community. I've said a million times, uh, devotees from Indian backgrounds are among the best devotees in ISKCON. They're wonderful devotees. They're not doing anything wrong. They're not doing anything. They're doing everything right. They're surrendering to Krishna. They're making an invaluable contribution. This is not a criticism of Indians. It's a criticism of ISKCON leadership in just pretending that we are not in an existential crisis and that if things play out over the next 50 years, ISKCON basically won't exist in the way that Prabhupada created it. And no one seems to care about this. And even when we prove that a certain strategy works, it's just, it's not really relevant. So, and then it plays out politically. If you want an integration of cultures in ISKCON, well, guess what? When one culture feels that ISKCON is kind of theirs and the West is insignificant and irrelevant, you're not going to get a balance. You're going to get an imposition of policies like Vaishnavi Diksha gurus that you can't have them, which basically cripple the movement in the West. Despite the uh, extremely admirable efforts of devotees like Kalakanta and, and other devotees who are doing these workarounds and I support them 100%. I do everything I can to support them. I think they're great devotees. But there's, you know, there's, you know, it's like we have a problem, Houston, and, and, and burying your head in the sand and just trying to paper it over with nice language is not going to make it go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, a lot of food for thought. And I think we need to to really go into into in, in depth how we can accommodate these identities in a positive way and, and keep Krishna consciousness in the center. So thank you very much. And uh, I agree. You, you're you're actually much nicer than me. So I'm just, you know, I'm good at criticizing and pointing out the problems. But to actually have the solutions, you're, you know, you guys are much nicer. So you're the ones that should actually do that. We'll, we'll try. We'll try. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.